another 35 years to enjoy the industry and the people that are in the industry. I think that in starting or talking to the matters at hand today and, and the subject that I was asked to talk about is what is needed for the mining industry to grow and prosper into the future. And for those that have been following some of my public remarks in the last 18 months, probably got a good idea that uh, I think there are some real issues in terms of the global industry, some real challenges, and I think today we're in a, we're in a location that is really trying to get its head around those challenges in a very constructive way. So for me, it is very much a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Um, as some would know, uh, Anglo Gold Ashanti has taken a very important step in partnering with our friends from Tani Emirates, Emirates Resources Holdings in exploration in countries including Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Djibouti, Ethiopia and Eritrea. We believe in the exploration potential for the MENA region and we believe in the development potential for the MENA region. Anglo Gold Ashanti has been, a, has been the industry's or the gold industry's most successful exploration group in the last 10 years or so, with nine major mineral discoveries to our credit. In light of this track record, we hope that what we say today will carry some weight with those that make decisions on how political and fiscal policies are constructed to help encourage both exploration and new mine developments. Bearing in mind the wonderful facilities that we are here enjoying today, I can only hope that the vision that has seen the creation of today's Dubai is open to a new conversation that will help continue to develop an exciting industry that will help sustain and grow that dream that Dubai has become. Now, before I go into my discussion about the mining industry, I think it is very important to set some context. When we talk about mining, we need to be clear. We are talking about the most important industrial activity on the face of the planet. Now, some may argue that I'm a little bit biased in having that view. A bold assertion, some may argue. So let me simply allow the numbers to do the talking. Global gross revenues from the sale of products from mining and quarrying were around 11.5% of global GDP in 2010. The value of services and supplies consumed to generate this GDP is estimated to be another 10% of global GDP, bringing the combination of the two to around 21 to 21.5% of global GDP. If we then consider the contribution of the products of mining to agriculture, fertilisers and mechanisation of agricultural methodologies have improved crop yields by more than 100% over the last 100 years adding a further 3.5% incremental contribution to global GDP. Manufacturing, steel and other products of mining provide the bulk of the materials that artisans work with into the tools of modern society. At 50% of benefit, at least a further incremental 7% contribution to global GDP. Energy and utilities, a world substantially powered by the products of mining, and I do inclu include the extraction of oil products as a form of mining, delivering 70% of feedstock and an incremental 3.5% of GDP. Transport, storage, communications, facilitated by the products of mining, and certainly a justifiable 5% incremental contribution to GDP. Other items in terms of service activities, public administration, and other items not captured, if we take a simple assumption that the products of mining are used to house people, facilitate communications, and interactions that support global trade, it is not unreasonable to assert mining products support at least 15% of the contribution of these sectors to global GDP. This incremental contribution adds another 6% to the global GDP, which leads me to a number in excess of 45% of, of GDP being either driven direct or indirectly by the mining industry. And while I'm open to debating whether the products of mining contribute to GDP in the proportions that I present, the envelope of contribution still exceeds any comparable industry activity by a quantum leap. It was interesting, I presented to the ICMM body last week 
a new development uh, or a collaborative development of the mining industry and I put these numbers forward and I had some very good NGO friends and we worked quite extensively with NGOs debating the 45% assertion. In the end we agreed that it was probably somewhere between 30 and 45% and as I said at the end of the talk, as an industry we don't advertise our cause very well. We don't talk to our industry and the contributions we make. But if I'm in a debate, in a public debate about mining's contribution to society and we're talking somewhere between 30% and 45% contribution to GDP, then it's probably a good conversation to be in and it's one that we should make certainly more known amongst our constituents and certainly in the public space. Everything you can touch in this room is either grown or mined, including the person you are sitting next to. Now they say that up until the age of 35, we continue to grow. So I think the growing assertion is correct. But somebody then said after 35, we start to deteriorate. Well, I might argue that for many of us after 35, at least our wastes continue to grow. So the first challenge we all face to help support our industry prosper into future is to promote what we do and how it, important it is into the lives, for the lives of 7 billion people that we share our planet with. At the same time, we can also point to the fact our industry is one of the least environmentally invasive industrial activities. We take up less than 1% of the Earth's surface in the extraction of the materials that support our global way of life. We produce less than 3% of the world's carbon gases, and we consume less than 1% of the Earth's water resources to produce our products. Now, I'm not talking about carbon gases in terms of energy consumption. That is more a conversation around behaviours and the way we operate but I'm talking about the physical act of mining. We produce the materials that are essential to clean polluted air, water and land so that we can support the health and well-being of those that we share our planet. In simple terms, we make the world as we know it possible and we make the creation of a sustainable, fu for our, a sustainable future for our children a possibility. If I talk about the mining industry and the future of the mining industry, we have to consider in today's world the future of mining is being tested as we restrict access to land with economic mineral potential. And this is a global issue, certainly not one that I'm putting forward as a MENA conversation. I'll get to the MENA conversation a little bit later. We've increased regulation and constraints on development. We're increasing resource rents, arbitrarily redefining the nature of the minerals market to the point where decisions around fundamental efficiency and net global benefit are subjugated to local political needs, the economics of expediency. Given where we are today, I will shape my conversation around these points and the specific context that must be considered for the MENA region to realise economic and social benefit from its vast mineral endowment. So in taking these points into account, I've broken my conversation into three parts the, to answer three fundamental questions. What is unique about mining and how does it differ in practical terms from petroleum or the carbon-based industry? What do we need to encourage investment and growth in mining? And how should people think about the mining industry and what it can bring to local and regional communities to establish an industry that creates value in the eyes of both its business and social stakeholders? It is in the answering of these questions that we can help define the pathway to establishing a sustainable mining industry. So first, what is unique about mining and how does it differ in practical terms from petroleum? In dealing with the unique nature of mining, one has to understand the physical processes and the consequences on costs over time. While I make some broad generalisation, my intention is to convey a sense of what drives mining costs and why volatile pricing of a commodity makes mining an inherently challenging business activity. It is the nature of the industry's cost structures and their relationship to volatile market pricing that makes the mining industry a very different beast to the petroleum industry. In mining, we make estimates of grade, or the quality of the deposit based on a relatively small sample size of a deposit. And I know our colleagues in the oil industry understand that. The one thing we know as planning engineers is the answer that we have is likely wrong. 
with the trick being to make sure we understand how wrong we might be so we can plan and manage risks accordingly. We generally mine deposits from the surface and as we, as we progress to depth, we experience an increasing cost base. The rate of increase directly proportional to the increasing depths we mine. As we mine, the complexity of the work increases as we increase the depth and breadth of the working areas. We also experience quality variability as a, fa as a function of nature's want to do the unexpected. In well-planned mines, we generally try to mine the higher grade or better quality material or parts of the ore body first to help pay back large sums of capital, but obviously that exacerbates the issue of cost creep over time. So over time, the real cost structures of a typical ore body increase on an annual basis, and these numbers will surprise most people. Increasing mining depths, on average, around, yes, I know it's shocking numbers, around 40 metres per year, drive unit costs between 2 to 5% per year. That is, most ore bodies mine from the surface, dropping through an ore body somewhere between 40 and 60 metres a year, then the fundamental cost increase due to the time taken to access the ore body, increased energy, support required to support the openings that you have to work within, will increase on a real basis unit cost by somewhere between 2 and 5% per year. Long-term ore grades on an industry trend basis and reflecting an important quality dimension are decreasing in the range of 1% to 4% per year and that's against ma most of the major commodity groupings. The bulk's a little bit different but certainly quality differentials are still very important. Reduced access to land and the maturity of currently accessible land has more than doubled expiration cost per unit of recoverable product in the last 20 years. This impact is around 1% per year inflation to the normal operating costs. New deposits tend to be found further from established infrastructure, increasing relative de development costs in the range of 3 to 5%. Now, if you go back through industrial history and we go back to the start of the Industrial Revolution, many of the major developed countries were pioneered through the mining industry that actually developed and grew infrastructure across the country. In the last 30 to 50 years, many of those countries, in terms of their mining industries, have lived off that work that was done 50 to 100 years ago in terms of infrastructure centres. And so we've been able to dine off the history of investment that we've seen as an industry. But as we break out into new areas, new investments are required and we don't have the benefit of history and therefore in the most recent 30 to 50 years, we've seen increasing costs as a consequence. Finally, due to the high intensity of use of the commodities that we produce in the mines that we construct, and due to energy consumption as well and energy intensity, input costs are tracking in the range 3 to 5% above community inflation numbers. While modern and progressive companies have efficiency improvement programs that seek to, dam seek to dampen these trends, the overall trend in time is pervasive. In most cases, costs increase anywhere between 10 to 15% per year on an average basis. And if you look at the gold industry cost structures in the last eight years, up 15% per year. Some of these trends driving them, other issues obviously important as well, but we've certainly seen these sort of trends across the major commodity sectors. At Anglo Gold Ashanti, we have a complex and fully integrated efficiency improvement program that we've been driving since 2009. While we have reduced our real cost by more than 20% in three years, that's per tonne mined, we are swimming against a rapidly rising tide where the head grades of mined material we've dropped by more than 20% over that same period. So while we are leading the industry in real cost reductions within our operations, we are still only tracking the average industry cost inflation numbers due to the lower quality ores we are mining and processing. Now, we saw this some years ago, and hence the business improvement program, but it's been part of the major restructuring of our business over the last three to four years. 
And to preempt the question, we are not deliberately mining lower grade material. It simply reflects the natural variability and sequencing parameters of the operations portfolio that we currently manage. In, the mining, in, in, in mining, the quality of ore deposits can be sub significantly variable over very short time frames. The cost of extraction can change dramatically and there is little downstream processing flexibility that can reasonably dampen or manage those cost swings. The issue of scheduling brings me to another key point. Mining is a long-term business where investment decisions are made within a 30-year view, with a 30-year view, 20 to 30-year view. To manage variability and risk is critical as we re are relatively constrained in our ability to react to short-term market movements. To increase flexibility means we need to increase the number of working faces that we have available, which means an increase in short-term costs. And by its very nature, the infrastructure costs for a mining operation are quite heavy. And you're either mining pretty well full capacity or you have to make major steps in rationalising or downsizing, which becomes very difficult in terms of playing unit costs. Flexibility comes at a cost, and flexibility with continuity comes at a cost. The science of good management in mining is to get the balance of investment in flexibility to manage risk in the right balance, in the, con in the context of a volatile market. Some would argue that it's more art than science, but certainly you need to know where you sit on the cost curve and manage flexibility and actual cost structures over time. To bring all these points together in relation to mining at Anglo Gold Ashanti, we try to position our portfolio operating cost, and we've got 21 major operations across the portfolio, at the midpoint or lower in the cash plus sustainable capital cost curve. Cash cost and the way we report cash costs in the industry, I think, is a farce. It's wrong, it's inappropriate, it sends the wrong message. We have to include sustaining capital to get a true sense of what the actual cash outgoing costs are. And when you look at those numbers, the margins across the industry are generally pretty slim. When we look at our competitors, we try and position against those two key numbers as a total. At this level of cost, we should be at least better than 50% of our competitors in dealing with a volatile commodity price helping us to stick with medium to long-term operating and financing decisions that should contribute to the creation of long-term value for shareholders. The minute you're in that short-term game, high quartile costs, short-term decisions, ultimately you're destroying value, making it more difficult to compete, being right on the edge. An average 30% margin through the historical seven-year short life cycle on gold price, and we have long cycles and short cycles, and the short cycles invariably go around seven years, will see us do well in some periods and maybe not so well in others. But delivering a targeted 15% return on capital employed through the life cycle is what we target to do given the areas and the business in which we operate. This would place Anglo Gold Ashanti, and this is a 15% return, through the cycle as the top performer in our industry if we can deliver this performance through the cycle. We are currently delivering around 18 to 22% and we are the second top returner in the industry. Now, while we're, in, we're delivering industry leading returns, or certainly within the top quartile of an industry if we take the, the uh, cycle, what does this say about the rest of the industry? On average, the gold industry is delivering less than 10% returns and in many cases well below their average weighted average cost or their weighted average cost of capital. Even with gold prices where they are today, the industry is barely returning its weighted average cost of capital. So people ask, why has the industry been struggling to grow production, struggling to deliver real value and returns to shareholders? when we've seen record nominal prices. Well, part of it goes back to what I was talking to earlier. Two key factors, cost escalations and increasing government costs and charges. 
In a recent study, the average tax on earnings for the mining sector across a number of major mining jurisdictions averaged somewhere between 23% for Canada and 50%, 57, 50 to 57% for Australia, depending on how you take the resource, resources super tax. And that includes the carbon tax. In this environment of aggressive cost escalation and government costs and regulatory imposts and uncertainty, it is not surprising to see gold production statistics flounder. In fact, we've been flat for almost eight years in what is a record nominal price for gold. Certainly we're not at uh, real, pri real price records yet, but we're starting to get up there. Now, in dealing with costs, given, I that, g given that I am in Dubai, I will certainly not lecture this audi audience on the nature of petroleum production and costs. However, there are some points to make regarding our similarities before I deal with our differences. We both carry significant exploration risk on projects. The time frames from discovery to production are long. For the mining industry, the average development period from discovery to a development is around 12 years. We both have significant capital costs that re require long periods to amortise, in many cases well over 20 years. The technology and skills are very industry specific and the, available, the availability of skills is tight. The process of mining or extraction is a relatively, <coughs> excuse me, is a relatively low environment footprint activity, but constant diligence is required as mistakes can have exponential negative impact on local communities environments. So great care is required. From the day we commence operation, we are mining to completion, requiring an ongoing commitment to new resource identification and development. And a couple of statistics in the mining industry, for one, every 1,000 prospects, only 10 are developed, and of those 10, only three actually deliver on their pre-feasibility and feasibility estimates in terms of returns to shareholders. So we have a long-suffering shareholder base that we're seeking to do much better for and with. The cost of exploration and the search for an individual data point is massive compared to shallow and mining prospects. This is for the petroleum industry. The cost of exploration and the search for an individual data point is massive compared to our shallower mining exploration target. So we do have to think differently. This all-up risk, all risk characteristic requires a careful approach to exploration with, most, ma with ma most major projects joint ventured to help share the upfront cost and risk burden. Once, di once discovered, an oil deposit requires significant capital commitment, but the cost structures while in operation are relatively low, as low as 5% in some cases for gross revenues. That is, the key area of risk management is around exploration, and I'm being overly simplistic in making these comments. Once developed, operating margins are extremely robust and can reasonably carry volatility in oil prices within reasonable limits. Post-discovery, consistent with robust margins, government tax structures can be constructed around more predictable revenue streams. Ongoing capital development costs in mining can actually exceed ongoing operating costs as the need to continually access new oil zone requires further cash outgoings irrespective of the revenue profile. That is, ongoing capital development is expensive and must be considered when looking at cost margins for mining operations. The challenge for a hard rock mining operation is margins will likely be much tighter having little scope for price variation due to rapid margin compression. In this context, the volatility in cash generation will be strongly cyclical, requiring flexible tax and revenue structures. As a simple sensitivity test, a 20% price variation in a mining project with a 30% cyclic margin will result in a 67% drop in cash flows. In petroleum, a similar price change for a 60% margin business result in a 33% change in cash flow. The point here, if we apply a petroleum taxation regime to a deep mining operation, the absolute numbers in terms of tax may in of themselves be a barrier, a significant barrier to development. If we add the volatility in cash flows, then many mining companies will lot not likely be able to support development due to the inherent cash flow risks in the business. 
In the Australian case, the government has put in place a taxation model that more reflects a similar structure to that of petroleum producer states. The problem with this model is reflected in my comments a little earlier. Super taxes on volatile commodities with relatively low margins presents an exponential exposure that are considered, that are considered for long-dated investments. Given the nature and occurrence of minerals around the globe, there is always likely to be an alternate investment project that will attract development funds ahead of a slim margin or deposit that has to carry the extra burden of a super tax, where the potential upside or risk cushion is eaten by the government. And as I said, for a thousand developments, 10 mines, three successes. Now, we're not short of resources around the world. The challenge is, economic, the development of economic resources and if government structures, taxes, other regulatory regimes make it, make it too tight or too risky, there are other places we can go. In light of these differences, at Anglo Gold Ashanti we've consistently advocated for a royalty regime applied to earnings. This simple structure can be turbocharged to take into account exceptional margin situations. If based on earnings, it effectively deals with both low margin situations in terms of affordability and associated affordability in terms of high margin periods through commodity life cycles. As a, that's, that said, it can effectively deal with wind pro profits if and when they occur. The key point to make when constructing a fiscal regime in any particular environment, it must reflect the nature of the industry in terms of both its vulnerabilities and its cyclic high points. Understanding the competitive dynamics, margins and returns, and the short and long price cycles must inform the fiscal structures that are used to help regulate and support the industry. As a final point, these dynamics can also vary within mining sectors. So not all hard rock industries are the same, not all commodities are the same, the bulks, the base metals, all have their own peculiarities and require careful consideration in terms of the way we set up political and fiscal regimes or reg regulatory regimes. The key point, the key request we make as an industry is please think carefully about the structures, the flexibilities, and be open to a conversation that suits the industry and the ore body that is proposed to be developed. So how do we encourage investment growth in mining? The first point to, be, the first point to make about mining is we're forced to go where the gold is. While the development of an open-cut gold mine on the outskirts of London would be convenient from a number of perspectives, it still remains an unlikely event. Now, most people would think the logistics of setting up an operation would be the challenge, and that'd be right. However, this challenge would be nowhere near as challenging or as daunting as trying to mine gold from a barren surface or from a barren surface and clay sediments. Mining is about real estate. In exploration, the same old real estate terms apply. It's about location, location, location. So the first thing that governments must do is to understand where its mineral potential resides and it must provide reasonable access. The terms and conditions of that access must be clear and deliverable from both sides. Security of tenure must accompany the granting of a land package on the assumption both parties have fulfilled their respective obligations. There is no more poisonous conversation around the global mining industry than to threaten a company with a loss of its ground or an operating asset. Now, if the obligations haven't been met, then that is absolutely a fair and reasonable conversation. Without security of tenure, we have nothing but the intellectual capital necessary to find another ground position. And with the aggressive competition for good addresses, it is a tough market. In South Africa, the disastrous nationalisation debate has been promoted by many who have an apparent vested interest in bringing down the rainbow democracy. However, how else would one rationalise the damage that has been done to the country's international political and investment reputation? It's not about the details and the logistics, it's about the threat to the ownership of the asset. In some other modern jurisdictions, one of the great 
geological provinces in the world, and I won't name the country, we still have to go through a jackpot and negotiation process once a deposit is found. As Anglo Gold Ashanti, we've been the world's most successful gold explorer over a number of years, and we still cannot think of one redeeming quality where a discovery has to be handed back to the state to go into an open bidding process once it's been discovered. Why would we commit the best exploration brains in the world to a jackpot process that gives everyone else a second chance at one of our discoveries? Life is tough enough as it is. In that context, I see this state will remain as one of the perennial underperformance in terms of potential and actual results delivered. For me, a better solution would be to have a transparent licensing cost structure award endowment around endowment may be reflected through a different payment scheme or a deferred payment scheme. This strikes me as being more logical and certainly more equitable in terms of the application of intellectual capital. Political direction and the ability to demonstrate consistency of policy direction over multiple electoral cycles is a key to encouraging investment in exploration and mining development. If you have a sense that policy strategy and direction is apolitical, this is a significant advantage when looking to attract mining investment. Alternatively, the use of long-term stability agreements to give companies certainty over multiple electoral cycles is another tool that can be used to give miners the comfort they need per regulatory certainty. And again, I transpose those two models on a global basis. Countries that have a history of not honouring agreements doing backflips on stability agreements or radically changing the rules for doing business will attract less investment over time. As I mentioned earlier, the world is actually not short of physical resources, but it is short of accessible land, strategic and consistent policy structures, and sadly, far-sighted politicians. Present company excluded, of course. The nature of the regulatory frames are also important. As we described earlier, or as I described earlier, certainly on pool regulatory frameworks, we will not encourage mining investment. Regulations have to be well thought through and flexible to circumstance, in addition to being consistent and reasonably applied. The availability of local infrastructure and skills can be addressed over time, but it can only be done in partnership with local leaders and appropriate government de development structures and frameworks. As a concise summary of the needs for exploration and mining developments, we need access to prospective land, certainty of land tenure, constructive and supportive regulatory structures, which includes taxation and fiscal arrangements, consistency of application of regulatory frameworks that match the long-term nature of mining investments, flexibility to cope with physical nature of the deposit, and the vagaries of the commodity market at which it delivers product. And that's where I'm talking about royalty regimes based on earnings as being one possible flexible structure and infrastructure and skills. While no jurisdiction provides all of the ingredients in a simple structured format, it is those countries that have taken the time to understand the nature of the mining industry that are attracting a large proportion of investment dollars, all other things being equal. In the end, it is also as much about flexibility and trust between developers, regulators and other social stakeholders. A final important point to note is to draw from the experience in the Middle East as it relates to petroleum policy. The Gulf region in particular has benefited from far-sighted and liberal fiscal policy applied to its petroleum business, which has then helped attract investment to grow its broader industrial transport tourism and, as we heard, quarrying and mining base. While my argument today is the mining industry needs a different regulation and fiscal regime and meaning relative to others, the attributes of forward thinking and a liberal fiscal policy should still apply in principle for the mining industry. It's about making sure we apply the lessons in an appropriate way to our industry. So bring your foresight and flexible thinking and you are 80% of the way towards creating a positive environment for investment in the mining industry. In terms of thinking about mining as a social partner, social partner, we believe that we need to do much better in terms of the way we've invested in the industry. 
Mining, we need large tracts of land when we first enter a region as we do not know where a deposit may reside. Our early exploration activities are relatively benign and non-intrusive. We can, for the most part, work out where a deposit may be located from aerial magnetics or other remote or minor surface disturbance methodologies. The important thing for us to do in relation to our stakeholders is to carry out this phase of work in a reasonable time frame so that we don't tie up those large tracts of land for a long period. We find the quicker we conduct this part of the process, the more goodwill we create as we release land for others to investigate or for other uses. This is an imperative for our industry and one that we're not terribly good at. In developing our prospects, we need to be more open to collaborative land use. In Ghana, Anglo Gold Ashanti is now working with local farmers to enable them to extend their operations into our land holdings. We will become partners in agricultural activities and other developments in a way that complements each other's activities. In a recent speech I gave in Brazil, I talked about how the mining industry is partnering in, partnering in community developments in the DRC. In our two new projects, I described, described how more than 20% of our project development costs were dedicated to providing new social infrastructure that benefited our broader community partners establishing clean water and reticulated water for broader community use, upgrading local hospital and health facilities, providing power to local residents, establishing roads and other infrastructure that supported new commercial activities, including transport access to take agricultural products to markets that were previously inaccessible. So really transforming a subsistence agricultural economy to one of development and growth and public works and projects for local, local use and benefit. We must think in a much broader terms, or we must think in much broader terms in terms of delivering value to our society. And so the list goes on. One of the members of the audience in that Brazil conversation was a senior NGO official based out of New York. And he asked a very simple but insightful question. Why do you call yourselves an extractive industry? when in actual fact you are more of a development industry. Surely your message should be about the good things you can and should do in local communities, rather than making it sound like you are as exciting as a trip to the dentist. He was, of course, absolutely right. The mining industry is an industry that can and should be supported by governments, both in terms of the wealth that can be created by the utilisation of natural resources that sit beneath the ground that we walk, and through the community transformation that we can help affect. And by support, I don't mean subsidies. I am speaking more in terms of the creation of a real partnership in terms of developing the potential of the communities in which we work. Beyond the immediate and obvious benefit that comes from our product, we can also be used to help build broader social infrastructure that supports development of local regions and population centres. At the same time, I must be quick, I must be quick to add or reinforce that we do not want to take on the role of government. However, by the nature of our work and the scope of our projects we build, we can be a very important partner in building long-term social infrastructure, and that benefits local and community regions. The ICMM literature around partners in development, I think, is a great read, and certainly will give people a good sense of what we believe is possible. As a final thought, and in reflecting on how I should wrap the conversation, I thought about how I could motivate you to think differently about what has been done in the past to help people or to help motivate people to do things differently to create a new future for the industry and society in which we operate. In working my way through that thought process, I came to the conclusion that the best way to make the point was to simply share the logic behind Anglo Gold Ashanti's move into the MENA region. And while my conversation is around gold, the logic holds true for many other commodities. The region in which we have interest, stretching from Saudi Arabia in the east to Egypt, Ethiopia, Eritrea in the west, is an area twice the size of the famous Yilgarn Craton in Australia, one of the great resource regions in the world. Yet with similar rocks, the gold production from this region is less than 10% of what has been found in that same time frame. In our view, there is a very good chance that the gold is here and that the reason for the difference lies not in the rocks, but more likely in the affairs of men and women. 
As is a testament to this conference and its underlying theme, one has to believe that the time for MENA is now with us. In that regard, let me say, the future is in your hands. The future is in our hands. Let's create it together. Thank you.